Cheers. All right, so uh, hello everyone. I hope you're all doing well and thank you um, for joining us today. On behalf of the Assyrian Studies Association, I'd like to welcome you to today's exciting book webinar, Grammar of the Modern Assyrian Language with Dr. Ephraim Yildiz. My name is Alexandra Lazar and I'm the Executive Director of Assyrian Studies Association, a nonprofit organization that works to promote the interests and academic study of Assyrian heritage and culture. We do this by supporting research, scholarly publications, and collaborative projects. We function as an instrument to advance the studies of the Assyrian people by facilitating contact and exchange of information between scholars, academic organizations, and communities across various disciplines. I'd like to take this opportunity to share some interesting projects we are supporting this summer and throughout the fall. First is our new grant opportunities for academic scholars, graduate students, and authors who are currently working on a project that either promotes the interest in or academic study of Assyrian culture and heritage. One of these grants, the Academic Publications Grant, we invite proposals from scholars for a feasible research project on Assyrian related topics in any field of the humanities and social sciences. Funding up to $2,000 is available for researchers currently holding an academic position, including graduate students um, in master's programs and the PhD programs from an accredited university. The deadline is August 1st, so if you or you know anybody who is interested in applying, please visit our website at assyriansstudiesassociation.org slash grants for more detailed information. Second, we are proud to announce that we are supporting a film project the documents Assyrian refugees living in diaspora, having escaped genocide to establish a new home in the United States. The film depicts historical in color photographs from a Chicago Assyrian who traveled to various Assyrian communities throughout the United States, such as Chicago, Yonkers, New York, Elizabeth, New Jersey, and New Britain, Connecticut. This film was submitted by the filmmakers to the National Film Archive of the Library of Congress. If you are interested in supporting projects of this nature, please take a moment to donate to help us continue preserving Assyrian cultural heritage 365 days a year. Today, we are very fortunate to have Professor Ephraim Yildiz from the University of Salamanca in Spain to talk about his latest book, Grammar of the Modern Assyrian Language. Please note that this book is currently available for purchase on our website. Book talk webinars like this are designed to promote the Assyrian heritage and culture. These events feature leading academics and authors from around the globe to discuss important topics, offer education and enrichment at a time when our usual resources are unavailable and many of us are confined to our homes. It is also provides opportunities for participants like yourself to engage with authors across various disciplines by joining in on the conversation. We encourage all participants of this webinar to ask questions by using the Q&A feature at the bottom of this page. And um, just as a courtesy, we will be answering your questions towards the middle of this discussion. In addition, the announcement of the free book giveaway will be revealed approximately midway through this discussion. So please stay tuned for that. Also note that this is a one hour and approximately 15 minute recorded webinar. And if we happen to go over the allotted time, your question will be answered via email that you provided when registering. The recording will be available on our website at assyriansstudiesassociation.org and on our YouTube page for your viewing later today. And now I'd like to introduce our speakers for today. The first is our moderator, Dr. Sargon Donabed. He's an associate professor of history at Roger Williams University, where he teaches Near and Middle Eastern history and religious studies. He regularly researches cultural heritage and history, as well as methodology, folklore, and wisdom literature of the ancient, medieval, and modern world. His contemporary focus consists of the indigenous and marginalized communities, but also threads on continuity from the ancient to the modern period. He's one of the foremost experts on the perennial history of Assyrian Mesopotamian culture. His most recent book, Reforging a Forgotten History, Iraq and the Assyrians in the 20th Century, details a narrative of Iraq in the 20th century and refashions the Assyrian experience in an integral part of Iraq's broader contemporary historiography. It is the first compre comprehensive account to contextualize a native experience alongside the emerging state. Next. Oh, the voice has gone. Argon, do you hear uh, Sandra or not? 
Alexander. Andrew, you're frozen. I don't hear her at all. Alexandra, she might have just got frozen for a second. I let's see, let's give her one second. Well, let me. I can introduce Ephraim. I can introduce you. Um, so our our main speaker, or the um, the focus of our presentation, our book conversation today, is of course Dr. Ephraim Yildiz, who um, we're very pleased to have among us today uh, to talk about his book, um, this grammar of the modern Assyrian language which we will discuss um, today. And here's Alexandra, you're back. I'm sorry, it's my connection to the- No problem. We, uh, we, we, we were just about to use Ephraim, so go ahead, please. So sorry, let me just, um, let me just take off from where I landed. Um, um, so Dr. Yildiz has participated in numerous national and international congresses. He's also given seminars and courses on his speciality in European countries, the Middle East, Latin America, and the United States. Dr. Yildiz has participated in several national and international research projects. He's a committee member of several national and international specific journals and is an author and coordinator of a large number of books and articles in journals on Aramaic language, literature, history, and culture of the Aramaic speaking peoples. His latest book, Grammar of the Modern Assyrian Language acts as an instrument to assist in the explanation of the modern Assyrian language and in the conservation of the linguistic cultural heritage of the Assyrians. It is a practical, methodological, and progressive and pedagogical book that systematizes the modern Assyrian language, while at the same time considers the contemporary and innovative linguistic tools required for learning a modern language. The book is divided into three large sections, writing system and phonetics, morphology and syntax. Additionally, this book includes a bilingual word list to permit the reader to carry out the exercises that aim to reinforce the explanation of the grammatical cases. And now I'd like to turn the stage to our moderator, Dr. Gonabed, and to our speaker, Dr. Ephraim Yildiz, to begin this book talk. Welcome and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Alexandra. Um, Thank you so much for the introductions. Um, I'm just going to have a bit of a conversation with Ephraim. As you guys know, this is sort of a general discussion of his work. And I wanted to sort of take it back a little bit and introduce you um, to uh, Ephraim as both the, the scholar, um, sort of this, <clears throat> the constant and consummate scholar of, of languages in general, but specifically um, of Assyrian and its various usages um, and uh, within its various time periods. So uh, we met, I believe in 2003, and um, as a student at the time, I was a student uh, just finishing my master's, maybe starting my PhD, um, and I was invited to spend some time in, in Spain to, um, to meet um, Dr. Yildiz, and I was lucky enough to, to meet him. Um, and one, probably the, one of the most interesting things that struck me immediately was I know many linguists, uh, many philologists who, um, who study a variety of languages, but I know very few who are proficient in that many more. Um, and what struck me probably most powerfully was that Ephraim, um, how many different, how many languages do you speak? If you, if you don't mind me asking, how many do you speak, read and write? Because I find this to be probably one of the most important things. Well, uh, at least the, it depends whether I'm tired or I'm on. I'm <laughs> smooth. Well, an average of 10, 12 languages. Yeah, I manage them well. Yeah. And I have to say, I've, uh, I've heard you speak English, I mean, Assyrian, of course, English, German, Turkish, Kurdish, uh, French, Spanish, of course, Hebrew, Italian. I've, I've been witness to that. So I must say that as a, uh, to, to be able to utilize the languages, to have control over the languages, Ephraim truly is um, a scholar, a true scholar um, uh, of language. So in, in that or within that vein, I, I have to say, of course, um, Ephraim, can you tell us sort of a little bit about it when I, when I picked up the text, and of course I have the original Spanish text um, and I have the, the English version of it. Um, when I was looking it over, 
of course, I, for most of us, we have a variety of different projects in the academic world. Can you tell us a little bit about this book? You know, how did it, at least how did it begin? Was it part of a longer term project? Again, I know this was birthed from the Spanish grammar, but the Spanish grammar itself, you know, where did it come from? Was it something specific that engaged you in, as you are a, a scholar, of course, and a, a professor in Hebrew and Aramaic studies at the University of Salamanca, was it simply something within your field or was it something that was of, of, of additional interest to you when you approached it? Well, if you allow me, think, uh, I would like to thank the uh, Student Study Association for this invitation and to share this work with you. It's a huge pleasure to be with you. And especially when, when it, you know, it's uh, about such topics which are absolutely needed and very interesting. So thank you for this invitation. I'm very pleased to be with you uh, for this while. Now, as far as your question is concerned, uh, Sadhguru, I'm, I'm going to, to be much more, you know, not so politically correct, you know, Dr. Son Donabed, because I know you, you know me, <laughs> Alexander, we know you. So I, I'm going to, to shift a bit this kind of formalities. So Sadhguru, now, as far as your question is concerned, it has been uh, a long project. I have been studying, as, as you mentioned, uh, the ancient period, the ancient languages. I, if I go back even to the, to the um, thousand, hundred BC, and from then onward, I have been studying the, our language in its different uh, periods. And then I stopped with the modern one because uh, I saw many, many years ago, I saw the need of, or I felt the need to see a grammar book which should uh, ha somehow help the new generation to learn the Assyrian language according to the modern tools. It doesn't mean that there aren't books written uh, or grammar books uh, that are written in even in the Assyrian language. I I saw uh, I felt the need to to focus on a methodological work that could help learning the language in a progressive way. That's why the method is is very important. So it's and somehow it has been a work of at least seven eight years research work. First learning how many other grammars were written about, about the same, modern same language uh, and how they were focused. Because now they are, I, I have seen also uh, the Hebrew uh, and many other modern languages, uh, grammar books. But as far as the same language is concerned, I came to the conclusion that we should focus in a much more practical way to explain the language according to the 21st mentality. Mm. Because if you, if you, uh, as you have read the book, you will see the changes I have introduced. Uh, we'll, we will talk about it. It's the first time we are just uh, somehow emancipating the Assyrian language in relation to the liturgical language, which has been the strong uh, part of what we call uh, the so-called Syriac or late Aramaic period. So it's in reality, it's, 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 a, it's a part of a, of a long-term project that has been started many years ago. And also it was somehow, because we are teaching also a modern Assyrian or modern Assyrian Aramaic at the university. And I, I saw and I felt the need to work on a, on a, on a tool that could help also our students. Imagine now my students who were my students now are my colleagues are teaching a modern Assyrian language at the University of Salamanca. So, and they use such tools. So it's, it has been really a, a long-term project. I have been working at least seven years. The Spanish version uh, has um, suffered some, some changes in relation to the English version one, because the, the, if, you, if you see, uh, the, the, the Spanish one hasn't a vocabulary and many other uh, parts like, like the poem about Akitu, the Habnison and so on uh, poems. But anyway, uh, the, yeah, the project was really 
started many, many years ago because I um, came to the conclusion that an academic work was needed and I have been working on it. Mm. And I'm happy that uh, now the results are there and you can also have access to them. Well, to, to, to go with that idea of um, practicality of the book, the practicality of, of the grammar, um, and the ability or, or your, your ability to utilize also uh, culture um, and like color and sort of symbolism, um, you, you sort of, you, you broke it down in a particular way, right? You, you sort of divided it into the three sections as, mentioned, as, as Alexander had mentioned. Um, and the way in which you approached it, um, of course, I find very interesting because as you said, you mentioned the idea of div sort of divorcing it in a way, not completely, but from the classical Syriac textbooks that we typically see. Exactly. And so there is this issue. So for instance, you know, when you get Faxton's grammar or Robinson's paradigms or something, you, you start off with things like um, uh, learning verbal forms and memorizing the verbal forms and then doing that mostly for, for people who are interested in, of course, reading biblical texts or things along, the, you know, maybe perhaps historical texts or biblical texts or exegetical texts. Um, but you don't do that here. What you do is, is something vastly different, and that is you engage in, in, in the culture of it. And so what, what drew me and what sort of uh, popped out to me was also I find the exercises to be so important, right? The, the utilization of those exercises. Now, there are some other grammar books, as you said, for modern Assyrian. I was thinking, of course, of Nimrud Simono, and I, I was wondering if, if that had any influence on you. But beyond that, also, I, I wanted just to hear a little bit about, if you could tell folks about, you know, that cultural element, because I think that when you're learning it devoid of that cultural element, then it, it seems to have a very dry and almost dead nature to it. And I find that a language that's used as, as sort of, uh, it's, it's in, for all intents and purposes, dead, right? It doesn't have this cultural continuity. Um, you don't have that attachment to it. But you've utilized, you know, of course, poems and discussions and names and symbols that are obviously very uh, culturally oriented. Can you say a little bit about that and maybe about Nimrod Simono or it's, any it's, influence? It's a uh, very important and interesting question. I have been... Honestly, I have been reading, I don't know how many hundreds of grammars, not only in, 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 uh, as far as the modern part is concerned, but also the classical one. But as you have mentioned, they were focused on how they can become an instrument for a specific uh, issue, like the biblical texts, exegesis, and so on. In my opinion, I have been learning many languages and I have been learning them only by myself. In, in my opinion, learning a language, not just managing or mastering, uh, as you said, uh, the conjugation to know how the structure is, but you have to arrive to the level to manage the language, to feel the language. Mm -hmm. and modern Assyrian language is a, a, a life language. You can't just limit it to a certain uh, part which is somehow considered a clerical part. My, my aim uh, was or has been, meanwhile, I was trying to, to, to write the grammar to also to, to combine both the technical part, which are the definitions of the grammar, but at the same time, these definitions must be applied in a practical way, which means if you don't have those phrases or sentences or words that are directly linked to what, how this, or how the Assyrian think, how they feel, and how, what they understand uh, for such a uh, specific symbol, then the language is going to be learned in a technical way, but it remains just as a theory. And my aim was to convert the learning of a modern Assyrian language as a totally natural mean that the Assyrians use as any other language, German, but a German or French or Italian or Arabic or Hebrew or whatever in modern sense, uh, uh, what, what it means learning a language. So learning a language, it means not 
uh, mastering a language that uh, serves to, to analyze a text or to read a text or to just conjugate or to make the inflection of, 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 of a name. No. Uh, the aim of the grammar is if the student follows or the, the interested person uh, follows the different parts which you have well uh, defined, uh, it starts from uh, the alphabet writing system, it goes through the vowel system, and then it touches the morphology, which is which touch the, na the, the name, the adjectives, the prepositions, and the verb system. But then you have to know how to apply that part in a syntax, which is needed, because otherwise you will always remain like, yeah, I need it for analyzing a text. No, a serial language is not a dead language. And this was the mistake probably of the main grammars I have been uh, reading or consulting. This is the, the step I want to emphasize on writing the book or the grammar. What were some of those grammars that you took a look at and you felt that were sort of lacking in this form? But all, all those grammars that I have been, uh, whether they were written in Italian or in French or in English or in German, they were focused or they were thought for a student who was going to be introduced in the Semitic languages, mm -hmm. which is good. But now the, the part, the classical part, it's okay, but the modern ASEAN language should, should go beyond that, that uh, level. Because if an ASEAN or a foreigner wants to learn a, a, the ASEAN, modern ASEAN language, should not think that he's learning the classical Syriac or the Middle uh, Aramaic or even the Imperial ASEAN Aramaic. No, he's learning the modern ASEAN language how the Assyrians think, how they feel, and how they transmit their legacy. This is one of the, let's say, the new characteristics of the, of the grammar. That's why I use the names according to the Assyrian tradition. Even I touch the tra Assyrian traditions in the exercises. I teach at the same time, I give some exercises which are uh, related to the experience of the school life because what I want to transmit is that the Assyrian language is really a, a, a life language like any other modern language. You have to learn it in this way in order to also to understand the Assyrian culture, the, the Assyrian mentality, and also the way of how they think and how they feel. And it's, it's, uh, it's of course, extremely important to understand that uh, not simply with neologisms, um, although we were speaking about that before we started, but and neologisms are extremely important um, for a variety of reasons. Um, but just the usage of words in modern, new and modern contexts, whether they be borrowed contexts or uh, just appropriated contexts for, um, for the Assyrian community to utilize the Assyrian language. So I was thinking of, and of course, you know, many, those of you who, who know this, who are listening, um, in the, the Western Assyrian uh, dialect, the usage of, especially in, in Northern Europe for something that's cool, right, in English. Oh, that's so cool, man. That sort of, that usage of cool in English is, is, is normalized, well-documented. But to use, you know, in the Eastern would be, you know, something like payuchta, which almost nobody uses. But in the Western dialect in Northern Europe, fayuhu is used all the time. It's a very typically you know, sort of an, an additional thing. But if you're not aware of it, it doesn't sort of make sense. Even in the context, depending on where you are, you really truly have to get to know the language, as you said. Um, and I, I, to, to, to piggyback on that, which, which dialect did you choose? I mean, I know what you chose, but for the, for the listeners, did you choose a particular dialect and script? And why, why did you decide to do that? Well, uh, it's not a question of dialect. It's a question how the language uh, is, is expressed by the main, uh, let's say, uh, the major group. I, I have been touching the Western, let's say, 
and it's not a dialect, a Western world system. The same language, if you, if you compare it with, if you compare both world systems, Western and Eastern, at least at about 98%, they are the same. Okay, there are just slight differences as far as the world system is concerned, and somehow it's because also because of its uh, geographical uh, separation, they have developed, as you, ha uh, you said, expressions that are not in, uh, in the Eastern or, or the Eastern one, which is our US are not in the West. But at least 98%, the language is the same. This first uh, important issue. Why I, ha I have been using the, the Eastern one? Because I manage the Eastern one. This is the first step. Next work will consist when we, when the Nineveh Academic Chair is going to launch its, uh, let's say, first research projects, there will be a combined grammar between the Western and Eastern vowel system. Not dialects, they are the same language, but just they use a bit uh, a vowel difference system. That's, that must be clear, clarified. I have been focusing on that because I manage much better the Eastern uh, part of the language. It's not a dialect. If you analyze the language and the definitions are, which are given, it's what the Assyrian language is as it is as a language. So we should avoid somehow in reality the, the concept of the dialect. It's a whole language that has been structured according to the modern tools what a grammar needs. Okay, and, and but now coming back to, to what you have mentioned before, uh, why this word is used and how, in, in what sense, the semantic in, in, our, in, in our language or in, in the Assyrian language is huge. Some, a word can mean eight different ways or uh, has, can have eight or even nine different significance or meanings. Mm. Why I mentioned this part? Because uh, we are now mo probably most part of the of, of the of listeners are uh, have learned the language according to the Western mentality or Indo-European uh, language linguistic system. But translating or transporting a language which is totally different. Imagine German, French, uh, English, Italian, French, and so on. If you make a comparison, somehow it's very complicated to, to, you know, to explain the language according to a mentality that is, is by its own self. It's absolutely different. Mm. It's sort of like the, ling the world of philology created um, exactly. a framework, but they did, it in, they did it in a language and in a context that doesn't work for someone else or from, for another. That, that's the good thing because Imagine there are two different worlds. Hmm. The writing system, why you write from right to left and the others write from left to right. You start from there. Why in the ancient language you have uh, a diff totally different, uh, let's say, verb system. You talk about al, et pa'al, et pa'al, hap'al, and so on. Why? But this shows the characteristic of a clear differentiated culture which express itself by itself. Now the Assyrian language, if you, uh, if you submit it to an analyze, has been able to combine both of them. We keep the, um, the, ancient, the ancient, let's say, structure, but it is, it is at the same time updated. The Assyrian language the unique thing that it needs, you have mentioned, neologism. That part, as because we, uh, the Assyrian language didn't have the chance to have an academic council that has been working and also uh, developing the language. Now it's going to be the next step. This grammar would, 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 would serve somehow as bridge or as the first stone, my stone, to start working also on those fields. So the Assyrian language by itself is, uh, it has its own structure, its own characteristics from 
writing, phonology, morphology, and syntax point of view. But at the same time, is if you see, somehow it has also updated. Uh, we do have also some tenses that in the ancient language do not exist, like the continuous present. But in you, what you, you mean by the, by the, the ancient language, you're, you're talking about what's usually termed classical Syriac, right? Classical Syriac and ancient Aramaic and so on. Yeah, okay. yeah. It, that, that's why I insist why the importance you should distinguish between the liturgical language and what the people feel, think, and transmit as a people, as a whole group, according to their mentality, and also according to their customs, how they express uh, themselves. Which, this of is course, uh, uh, sorry to interrupt, but it, this, is, this is what you mean, uh, this is, uh, when you say it's a living language, it was living even while classical Syriac existed, right? This is something that has gone... But, but the problem has been, I have been studying Semitic languages for I don't know how many years. Uh, the idea that the, my masters and the generally in, uh, in the Western universities uh, that has been transmitted has been always, you are dealing with a dead language or literary language. No, a Syrian language is not a dead language, it's a live, a live language. And it has been developed parallel to the classical one. Okay, the system we have, for example, is, is very curious. If, uh, as far as the classical one is concerned, you, you do Gishma, which is a classical, and you do Pushaka. Why? Because the people have developed uh, mm, uh, communication, me uh, communication mean that doesn't follow exactly the literary language, mm -hmm. which is good because you see that the language, as in, if you, if you analyze the Spanish language, I have been analyzing the, text, the texts of Spanish language of the 16th, 13th century. The German, uh, uh, the same. The French, the same. One, they emancipated from the Latin one. Mm -hmm. The same process has been applied to the Assyrian uh, language, but we didn't have the chance to explain it to the Western world. Mm -hmm. Now it's time. Now that's why I'm focusing on the modern part. I have been learning and studying and researching for many, many years upon the classical one. I have, been, I, I have even published uh, the, the poems of uh, St. Ephraim upon the baptism and uh, the, how do you say, uh, the manifestation. But now it's time to focus on the modern Assyrian language, which is huge in content but the modern, the Western world didn't have the access or didn't have the chance to have the access to such a written. This is the main goal of such a grammar. Thank you, thank you. Um, I just have one more thing that I was thinking about <clears throat> as I was going through this, which was some segments, um, for those of you who, who know this, you know this well, um, you know, those of us who've gone through the whole linguistic um, gauntlet we've had to do, <laughs> you know, we're studying, if we're studying classical Syriac or the modern Aramaic. However, these things are termed in the university because of course there are a variety of names for them. But regardless of what we are studying, um, most of us go through a process of taking an introductory course, uh, being asked to learn the script, of course, first, as you mentioned, the, the alphabet comes first. And then usually to to do some reading and then trans, transliteration and then translating. So in portions of the text, you have many things transliterated, of course, right? U utilizing um, yeah. the Latin script to show um, uh, instead of the, 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 the Assyrian script, right? So it, can you tell me a little bit about that? It, just curiosity for me, but I know I'm sure a lot of people think about that as well. Um, do you feel that that's a necessity, that it plays an important role? You know, for, for, for instance, many people will say, um, it's very difficult to read these scripts, so why not just utilize a Latin script? But even if you put that aside, how do you feel, or what role do you feel that the transliteration plays in understanding, especially for someone who's new to it, understanding a language yeah. and understanding Assyrian? 
Indeed, if you analyze the, the main grammars of the 1980s, 1950s, uh, 2000, even in the last year, until, until 2005, uh, main, the main part of, of the grammars were transliterated. I, in my opinion, it's, it's a huge mistake. Now we have the means to write from, from right to left, even in word, like any other language. Why I have used, the, if you, if you, uh, as you have seen, the grammar is sought in a pedagogical way. The method I use is, I'm conscious of the fact that the, the, the learner or the, the person who is, who, is, who is learning the language, at the beginning he needs or she needs the first, you know, it's, 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 I, I have tried to do it in a progressive way. The first pages I have done in, in the original language and then they are at the same time transliterated. Why? Don't forget that the, the difference between, between the Semitic languages, in this case, the Assyrian language and a modern language, we do have some, for example, some, some uh, letters or consonants that do not exist in the Indo-European languages, like the emphatic ones, ka or a and ha. If I, if I don't uh, insist on writing them in the original language, they will gradually be neglected. And we as linguists, we have the obligation to keep the, the language as it has been transmitted and as it should be transmitted. That's why uh, you will see, I try to be in the, uh, as, uh, until page 80, I try to combine both transliteration and the original text. Why I insist on keeping alive uh, the, the writing system? It's not just a question of not using the Latin letters, but it's also a question how you, 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 you get the language according it's written and how you master it. I'll give you an example. The Syrian people in Iran who have been in touch with the Persian language, they have lost the head. They have converted in a fricative way. Fricative, it means they have shifted from ha, haube, to haube. Because the Persian language doesn't have the emphatic of het. Now, the same phenomenon happens with the Western languages, German, English, and so on. If I don't keep the letters which characterize the Assyrian language, then we will lose a, an important part of what the language represents. That's why you have to learn the language starting from the writing system until the, 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 the subordinate uh, sentence as an Assyrian sees, as an Assyrian feels, as an Assyrian transmits. Otherwise, you are not going to learn the Assyrian language as it is ready in its essence. This is, this is the main reason why I have uh, tried to combine at the beginning, and then you will see gradually, I gradually prepare the learner to read at the end in the language. And if he arrives at the end, or she arrives at the end to, to master the poem about Akito or uh, the first Assyrian, then I consider that I have accomplished with my mission for the grammar. Otherwise, it's not just uh, a question of writing a grammar. The intention of this grammar is to transmit the Assyrian language as it is, as it deserves. And that's why I insist to keep alive even the writing system. Thank otherwise, you. otherwise you will lose, you know, what would I, I consider the essence of really what a language represents. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. That was very helpful, especially for me. So I wanted to say thank you for that, Ephraim. So I want to, we want people to sort of chime in here and let um, our, our listeners uh, participate. So I'm going to turn it back to Alexandra and um, go to questions. Thank you very much, Alexandra. Thank you too for, um, for the amazing discussion. 
Um, before I actually turn to um, the Q&A, um, I'd like to take the opportunity to announce our winner of our book giveaway before we go ahead and, and continue on with the questions. Um, so please note that we did use an automatically generated software called Giga Calculator to randomize names of registrants of this webinar. And the winner will be sent an email to confirm a shipping address after the end of this webinar. So um, this is obviously the book and the person who, um, who actually is the winner of this book talks free giveaway. It goes to Esther Lang. Esther, congratulations. We're really happy and glad that you registered for this book talk. And we hope you will enjoy this new copy of Dr. Yields' new book. And Esther, and if you are on uh, currently in this webinar, you can go ahead and raise your hand so that I, I can know that you are here. Um, but I will be sending you an email shortly afterwards. Okay, so um, Dr. Yildiz stepped away for a second. I was, I was looking for, for a text. Yeah, sorry. No problem. Um, so I know that the audience has a few questions to ask you, Dr. Yildiz. Um, as a reminder to the audience, uh, if we do go over the time, your questions will be answered um, via the email that you provided. Okay, so why don't we get started with the Q&A. So our first question is from Nasir. Shalama everyone and thank you for uh, this interesting webinar with such a prestigious guest. I would like to ask Malpana Yildiz about the difference in his book title between the Spanish version where he uses Armio Marduna slash uh, modern Aramaic and the English one, modern Assyrian, from a philology perspective. Is there really a difference between Aramaic and Assyrian, if any? And what's the best way to explain this name variation, especially to non-Assyrians? I will start uh, answering. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting question. I, I, I knew that this question was going to be. <laughs> this, is, this is good. Well, I will, I'll start explaining uh, with an example with the Hebrew language. The Jewish community has been using always Hebrew, Hebrew, and so on. They have been even uh, using uh, the Aramaic square script or Assyrian square script of the ancient time, but it's called Hebrew language. Well, and then if you go now to Israel, gradually they have shifted from Hebrew, modern Hebrew or uh, biblical Hebrew to Isra uh, uh, Israeli Hebrew. Uh, the, uh, the modern Assyrian language in relation to Arameo Moderno in Spanish one, when I started, it, it's, it's, it has been like, like a kind of uh, introducing progressively in the culture, in the language. And that's why as the people were used to use uh, Aramaic, I used in Spanish because they are still, they don't know, not they don't know what to do with the Assyrian because always when I put Assyrio in Spanish, they link it immediately to the ancient period. But the English uh, expression when I use modern Assyrian is much more updated in that sense than uh, the, uh, the so-called Latin environment. That was why I used at the beginning Arameo Moderno, not Neo Arameo or not Neo Aramaic, which is also an, an, a misleading term. If you say Neo Aramaic, somehow it has been the translation of Neo Aramaic of the German one, which means modern one. But it, in in English, it doesn't. It means that it, you have started and you have stopped and you have restarted. The Assyrian language has never stopped being. Uh, taught, being spoken, and being transmitted. That's why I insist on the modern, whether Aramaic or modern Assyrian. But now the, the question, I'm, I'm arriving. Why I have used, the, the, the reason why I have used at the beginning Arameo Moderno in Spanish one, it's due to this fact, I'm conscious. You have to, to you know, gradually prepare the society in order to be receptive for uh, what they don't know about. Now, the, the English language is much more prepared or trained in order to, to tell them the truth. The modern Aramaic is spoken by the Assyrians. Whether they belong to the Assyrian, uh, to the Chaldean church or to the Syriac Catholic or Syriac Orthodox or 
uh, the Church of the East, all of them, they, as an ethnic group, they belong to the Assyrian community. That's why I, I have considered that it's now time enough to also to do justice in that sense. Because Assyrian language is, we know that we, uh, the Assyrian people have been bilingual, ancient Assyrian and also Aramaic. But now after so many centuries, if you analyze the, Assyrian, the modern Assyrian language, it keeps much more archaisms than the classical one. So now it's time to focus on what the denominations of the language uh, are. The language spoken by the Assyrians must be called Assyrian language. Whether it uses the, the letters, because otherwise we would call also the Aramaic language Phoenician language, because they have taken the Phoenician script and adopted it into Aramaic language. Should we call that our language Phoenician? No. But somehow, I don't know why the people uh, are, because of this you know, first uh, stage, when we talk about Assyrian, the people think about archaeology, about the ancient periods. Assyrians do not exist according to many uh, um, written, wrong written books. At the end, you arrive at the conclusion that the Assyrians did not exist. But they exist, they have their own language, and they have the right to call their language as any other language. I, I would ask a, a Spanish or an Italian, why don't you call your language Latin, lingua latina? It comes from Latin. The same, now my answer, why should I not call it Assyrian? Because it is Assyrian. Those who speak it, who feel it, and who transmit it and who work with it are Assyrians. This is the reason why I have started also after many years of calling it uh, modern Aramaic and so on. Now it's time to call it also it's Assyrian because Assyrian nation exists, Assyrian people exist, and they have their own language. And we should be respectful in that sense. This is the main reason why I have started calling it Assyrian language. Thank you for that. Um, so we have a couple more other questions. This one is from Ninos. Would Professor Yilda's explanation of the Assyrian language developing in parallel with classical Syriac be analogous to the Latin example of vulgar Latin and classical Latin? Uh, your voice has gone and come. Uh, uh, could you repeat the question, please? Because this, I know it's, it's an important question. That's why I would like to do it again because uh, the voice has just uh, has been cut off. Of course. Would Professor Yilda's explanation of the Assyrian language developing in parallel with classical Syriac be analogous to the Latin example of vulgar Latin and classical Latin? Well, uh, modern Latin, no. We should not call it modern Latin because uh, as Spanish or Italian or French or Portuguese and many other cultures who are from the, let's say, who belong to the, to the Latin or Indo-European, let's say, uh, linguistic branch should keep their language according they have been uh, according or according to what they have been uh, agreed. When, when they emancipated, in especially from, from the 12th century onward, because the first, uh, let's say, texts that have been written in the, vol uh, let's say, vernacular language are somehow uh, texts who belong to a recent period. I would uh, see the development of the classical Latin or classical Greek or even the classical Assyria, which is called Syriac and so on. What, what, I would, what I would like to explain in this sense is, when we call it Syriac, what does it mean? Syriac has nothing to do with only the clerical environment. Syriac, Surat, comes from Asuri, which is Assyrian. Why should I not keep, after now being uh, having seen the, the, the development of the language, why should I not see it as a development from the ancient period 
and the assembly language is huge in that sense. Uh, it goes back to the to the to to, to the uh, third millennia BC, and it hasn't stopped until now. The unique thing that has uh, changed is the writing system. Don't forget that. We should not confuse using uh, radicals or letters was how the language is structured. Okay? If you see the performative, uh, when we say bzali, uh, bet, no, which indicates the future, it has been in the ancient time. Kachlen, ke achlen, or ke garshen, is of the ancient time, which is used today in the 21st century. So, what I would, would, I would suggest is to see the development in a progressive way. It's, it's true that <clears throat> when the Western world came in touch with the Semitic languages, they were focused on the classical, on the ancient, let's say, part. This is why we don't uh, feel comfortable sometimes to, to make the jump to the modern part. Because uh, most scholars have been learning the language for uh, uh, specific purposes. Getting uh, in touch with the liturgical texts, with, with the study of biblical texts, but the Assyrians, they do have this richness, but at the same time, they have also their continuity until today. That's why the classical Latin or the classical Syriac, in the sense, has its continuity in a parallel way. We should not forget another important issue because uh, uh, we are used to only focus on the written um, sources or in written uh, tradition. What's about the oral tradition that the Assyrians have developed in a wonderful way? If you, if you, if you just go back to the, to, let's, let, I, I take always the Jewish tradition in that sense. If you see uh, Talmud, Mishnah, Tosefta, Baraita, and so on, they were during hundreds of years transmitted orally. And then they were written, they were dropped down, and they have become rules for the community of the Jewish uh, people. Now, nobody takes in account that the Assyrian language has its development in that sense also. It has been transmitted orally during centuries. But the Western scholars didn't come in touch with that part because they were focused always on the ecclesiastical texts, the liturgical texts, I mean, uh, biblical texts, and so on, or historical texts. Now it's time also to have a, a, a space for what we call Assyrian legacy or modern Assyrian uh, legacy and modern Assyrian language. Um, thank you, Dr. Yildiz. We have a, a few people who have their hands raised, so I'll go ahead and uh, unmute you so that you can go ahead and answer your question, uh, ask, excuse me, ask your question. Um, the first one's Esther, who's our winner of the book talk today. Let me go ahead and unmute you, Esther. Sorry, yeah. that was, I was, I was um, raising my hand because I won the book, and I think you had said raise your hand when you win the book, so I don't have a question, sorry. <laughs> oh, no worries. <laughs> Congratulations. I'm glad you were here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so um, our next person who had their hand raised was Anthony Narcy. Um, Anthony, let me go ahead and unmute you. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, Anthony. Hi, well, okay. right, thank you. Uh, uh, I just had one question. Do you think that this book could be turned into a school curriculum? Sorry, I haven't seen the book yet. Yes, the, the main idea is to start. Uh, this is a first, let's say, step. This is going, I'm indeed, I'm now, I have been talking with Dr. Donabit uh, last time when we, we had the chance to talk. I'm indeed writing the second book as a booklet which will reinforce the learning of the language. 
it's, it's, it's a project of at least seven different books according to the ages, because we have also to work not only for the scholars or for those who are interested in the language, but my aim is also to start working also uh, in, a, in a gradual way to somehow provide the Assyrian uh, people, the Assyrian kids, the Assyrian teenagers, the Assyrian uh, scholars with the means that they need in order to master their language. This is very important. A nation needs, Assyria, Assyria is a nation which needs its means. Language is one of the main uh, instruments, means, in order to feel how they think, how they uh, act, and so on. That's why uh, we have created, uh, it, we will talk about it, the Nineveh Academic Chair that has been created at the University of Salamanca will fo focus its efforts on providing the, those who want to learn the language also uh, starting from the seven years onward, when the kid still is able to start learning in a progressive way. We will have a book from seven to, to 10, from 10 to 12, from 12 to 14, from 14 to 16, and from 16 to 18, when they enter the university. This is one of the projects. This book is somehow a kind of um, first step of a huge project. And it's not only it, it's not going uh, it's not only uh, uh, a project that will focus only on the language, but it will combine at the same time with the history and literature, because a language can't be explained with its uh, literary context or historical context. So it's just a first step. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Okay, um, our next person is Reen. Um, let me go ahead and unmute you. Give me one second. Okay, can okay. you hear me? Hi, welcome. Hi, yes, thank you, Alexandra and uh, Sergan for such a great uh, event. And Rabi Afram, Basim Araba, I love just the day of presentation, but all the things that you have done, and I mean, the establishment of the Nineveh chair is just incredible. Um, so thank you for all that you do. Um, my question, uh, I guess you answered it a little bit in responding to Anthony's, um, but recently online, actually on Twitter, there was like a debate going on about um, like the importance of um, preserving our language and whatnot. And then during that discussion, um, there were some, you know, young Assyrians who faced criticism for not being able to speak the language. And of course, this was due to many different reasons. Um, and, uh, you know, in some cases, like the people grew up in mixed families and whatnot. And so um, for those Assyrians who have expressed a desire to learn their language, um, but may not have the resources, what steps can you recommend for them um, that exist uh, now? I know that you're working on things for the long term, but in, in the interim. Basim uh, Araba. Thank you, Rain. Uh, it's a pleasure to hear you. Uh, thank you. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Uh, indeed, we have, we have even focused on that part. The aim uh, of this grammar is to just start working, which it means is the first step, then it will be also at the same time accompanied by other activities. Uh, if, if we will be successful and we have the means, uh, we will launch two online courses from uh, 2021st onward. Once the COVID uh, virus is over, we will work uh, in, in a collective way, as we, we used to say in Assyrian. Uh, there is a beginner course. I have, I, I have still structured, the whole structure is done. Now you have to fill with the content, uh, the 12 units, the 84 hours, which are divided into three main, uh, let's say, uh, process. Uh, virtual classes, uh, exercises, and also uh, tutorial uh, hours. So the, the work is done, the work is ready to, to be launched. Now we are putting it on a platform where any uh, people who want to master the language will be able to do it 
in a virtual way. So we have a beginner course and an advanced course. But if this only as far as the language is concerned, I'm sure I have been even talking with, with Dr. Donabit that uh, we, the, the, the research group, Assyrian scholars will provide the future generation, whether Assyrian or foreigners, will provide the people with those means that will help them to have a clear idea up in the language, up in the history, and up in their literature and legacy. So this is, this is a huge project we are, we are starting. It's just the beginning. There are two courses, for instance, language courses, then there, are, there will be a course up in, up in the history and literature because a language can't be only taught in a very theoretical uh, way. It needs also to be uh, somehow done within the means that are needed in order to get really in touch with the language. We have to be able to, uh, to bring the student, whether a seer or, uh, or foreigner, to the level that when they speak in a Syrian, they should not use the bridge system. They get it, they translate it, and they then understand it. No, they, we will make them arrive to the level, to the, that point, when they speak a Syrian, the listener will immediately get, catch it and also understand it. This is the best way and the most practical way of learning a language. Rain, I don't know whether I have replied to your question. Well, I have answered your question. I hope so. Yes, yes, you did. But Simon, I was sorry. I didn't realize that it was trying to unmute me. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie. It was great. Thank you, Rain. Okay. Sure. Let me go ahead. And we have one more person who has their hand raised. And I'll go ahead and, and finish it up with the Q&A um, section. So James Yonan, um, let me go ahead and unmute you so you can ask your question. Switch on the microphone is. Oh, is this good? Hi, James. Can, you can hear you. Ah, okay. <laughs> sorry about that, Makhreta. Um, yeah. Um, sorry. Now I lost my train of thought. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I just wanted to um, agree that I think it's crucial that that uh, uh, Rabbi from Yildiz did a a, 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 a a grammatical and linguistic analysis of of the Assyrian language, but. Um, don't, wouldn't you also agree that it's important to preserve the dialects, for example, like uh, Urmishnaya and uh, the other various dialects? Uh, and I, I believe that even within the, for example, Urmishnaya, there's slight differences between the villages. And I think it would really be sad to lose all those uh, you know, nuances and differences between the different uh, ways of speaking the language. So what, what, what do you think could be done to um, preserve and save the different dialects? Thank you so much. Absolutely. It's not only uh, needed, it's urgently needed. Because this characterizes different regions where the Assyrians are living. I love dialects. I imagine I manage even the Bavarian dialect. Besides the German, I love, I, I, I speak Bavarian. It's, when I speak Bavarian, a German from north, he doesn't understand me. So, of course, there are huge works done up in different dialects, and dialects must be kept alive. It's because this is the way <clears throat> in order to see the different sides of a nation. South, North, East and West geographically are also a sign of uh, expression, uh, expre expressing the how they uh, talk, how they feel, and what their typical characteristics are, when whether they are Urmishnaye or Botanaye or Tur uh, Abdin or uh, whoever they are. Okay, There's, no, no, we have we we will work on the dialects, but a nation needs urgently its mean of communication. We have to have a common mean where we can understand each other. Imagine the Arabic language, it has fusqa, and then it has, I don't know, hundreds of, of uh, dialects. This is the same case of Assyrian language. It's not nothing new, but what we have to do is to keep it alive. 
The difference is the Assyrians the Assyrian do not have their own territory where they can develop their uh, legacy in its different uh, ways. This is the unique difference. Now it's urgently also, it's a question of justice that the Assyrians have their own territory where they can develop their language, common language, but also at the same time keeping alive. This is an imperative, not just a desire to keep alive those dialects that show us where we are from, how we express ourselves as part of that village or of that region. No, but a common uh, uh, communication mean is also necessary. This is why I insist to stabilize first the language. I'm from Herboli. My dialect has, it has to do with the Urmishnaya dialect, but it's quite different. It's like that's, that makes sense of uh, an alive nation, of a alive people. If you don't keep alive the dialects, it means you are dying. So, can, can, I, can, I, can I just ask you one piece of that to add to it? Uh, frequently when people would ask me, well, why are there so many words for one thing? And, I, and my response has always been, well, in every language, there can be a variety of words for the same thing. There doesn't have to simply be you know, the correct, uh, frequently you hear people saying, well, what's the correct word, right? What is the, what is the correct word for that? And uh, frequently I have to tell people there are a variety of words that are used in the same way that there are many meanings to one word, but there can also be many words that can equal one thing. The semantic in this sense is, is one of, of the, let's say, amazing fields where you can see the richness of a language. Uh, it's, the case, it's the case of Assyrian language, it's the case of Arabic language, Hebrew language, and Semitic languages are very expressive in that sense. That's why, but it's also a sign of a huge, large tradition, a huge, uh, large uh, transmission of a language that has been developed uh, at the top, but then, unfortunately, then it came down because the, la the Arabic language took over the whole, let's say, uh, power, and they weren't able to develop their language. That's why I insist on keeping the, the let's say, uh, the dialects at the same time to keep the, let's say, a common mean where we can understand each other. Imagine the, if, if you compare the, I'm, 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 I'm coming back to your question. If, if we come back to the English, if you go to Scotland, and then you go to, uh, to Ireland, and if you, if you see a Kiwi from New Zealand, they have different ways of expressions. Very true. And Semitic language, in this case, Assyrian language is, you can't imagine how rich our language is if you, if you learn the language from the beginning. This was my process. I have learned the ancient, the imperial, the middle, the late, and it's in, in its different ways. And then I try to, to use, the, there you see the richness, how a language has been developed. The semantic part of that uh, uh, section is amazing, but we have to master the language. The best way is using it, teaching it, and transmitting it. Yonan, Leden Jubli Shuala Did I answer your question? Yes, yes, yes. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm so happy that you agree that preserving the dialects and, uh, and all the different nuances. It's, it's imperative to keep alive the dialects. I manage many Italian dialects as well. Ima imagine the Neapolitan dialect. I love it. Exactly. Yeah, 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 exactly. Basima Rabba, my partner. Rabbi. Thank you, James. Are there other questions, or I I would I would uh, probably ask uh, people because I would love to have. I don't. I see only uh, Alexandra and uh, Sargon. There are. Uh, um, let me go ahead and let me read them. Um, so our first one. 
Oh, Al from, uh, Al Alexander, I think you're, you're, he's asking about, you're talking about being able to see everybody, right? Yeah, it would be good, yeah, because uh, I'm, I, we, we professors are used to be in the classes. I'm, I'm used to have face-to-face uh, -face classes, not just webinars, which is good. Uh, thanks uh, to, to you both that I, I, if I wouldn't see you, I wouldn't be inspired. I need faces to talk to. This is also the method we, we, we have been uh, lear learning and we use. So it is good to, uh, to have always, you know, as we are saying, Appel Appa, Metla, Bishbrain, Basim. So if we are talking face to face, our talking is even sweeter. So, um, but so yeah. if Unfortunately, the, the Zoom by accident, it, there was a technical error, so we won't be able to see attendees' faces. But I will be reading their questions. Um, there are a few more questions to be answered. Um, this next one is by, uh, the last name is Batu. Um, he's asking, um, he said, as a new, uh, he said the course will be starting on the 20th. Would that be of July? And where can we find more information about these courses? No, this uh, the you mean the online courses? The online no, courses. The online courses are going, now we are working on them, but they will be launched in the 2021st, okay. uh, for instance. So uh, we are now working, I have the structure. Now we are uh, combining the structure with the exercises, explanations that will be put on the platform. And once it's ready, uh, we will then announce it uh, and everybody can, it's, it's even uh, an official uh, title they will get from the university. It's not just an initiative um, started by Professor Ephraim, but it's also going to be uh, like a Spanish course or like a German course for beginners and advanced uh, students. Thank you. Um, so this next question is from Albert Neeson. Um, great work, Dr. Yildiz, and thanks a million for sharing your knowledge and work with all of us. My question is, is, is if there are any coordination between your work and the work of existing schools in Atra and Australia. Indeed, I have been in, in uh, uh, the first, why did I write or drop down this, this grammar? I have all the grammars that I have been used in Atra. First, what we do, we, uh, the first part of the research we, we do is to know how many uh, instruments or books have been written or grammar books are still uh, available in order to learn from them. And then I saw that a pedagogical progressive uh, grammar book was needed. That's why it's, it doesn't mean that the books that have been published are not well then known. I learned from, from that, those books to probably to apply them to a, a modern a way of learning the language. This is the first. Then I have been in Australia. I have been at the school uh, of the, Asian, uh, the, the, the kids and the advanced courses. I have been there and seeing what, it, what was needed in order to help and to contribute. Yes, of course, I'm in touch with, uh, otherwise I would work only in, in a theoretical uh, way. Uh, my aim is not only to transmit the language to the foreigners, but my main aim is to keep alive for the Syrian community, wherever they are, the language. And, but how can you do it if you don't know what they teach how they, they teach and so on. I have been even in discussion with the professor who did the books for, for, for the school in, in, uh, in Australia. So yes, of course, uh, this is the way we have to work. We, have, we should not mean that I, I have been learning or studying the language and then I will buy my own. No, I have to know what is needed and how is the best way to, to provide a mean for a person who wants to learn, in this case, the language. But this is the same with the, with the history. Uh, Dr. Donabit is not going to write a book up, up, up in uh, northern Iraq or the Iraq. Uh, he, he, he knows what he's studying about. He has been studying for years those regions, those peoples, and so on. And then he arrived to the conclusion what we have to transmit to the new generation. The language is the same. We have to know 
we should publish books that are needed from a practical and also pro progressive way. So uh, each time you, 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 you publish a book or you write a book, you have to think for what purpose it ha it's going to be done, especially a, a language book. So yes, of course, I'm with Atra, and I'm even, I have even had discussions with those professors in Atra and also uh, Gyaluta. Gyaluta means in diaspora. Thank you for the question. Um, uh, so we have one more question to be asked, um, and then we're going to begin a wrap up. So this, this one is from Ash. Uh, Mr. Yildiz, thank you for this interesting discussion today. I'm not an expert on linguistics, but in my personal experience, the foreign language textbooks that I have found myself enjoying the most were those that immersed you within the cultural context of the language. In future editions, aside from the historical and literal context, do you plan to incorporate a modern cultural aspect to the language books? For example, teaching the language while also exposing readers to the daily life of native speakers in Iraq, Iran, or around the world within the diaspora. Thank you. Indeed, if you, if you see the exercises are based and focused exactly for the purpose that the, the lady has been, uh, Ash has been uh, underlying. Yes, of course. The, if, 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 if the grammar book doesn't touch the way of thinking, of reasoning, of handling of a people, the book would be useless. So even the exercises are used, the phrases are used, the examples are used, are focused exactly for this purpose. Uh, I, have, I have used different, even uh, traditional aspects of, of Assyrian people. If you read the exercises, I even transport the, the reader to Northern Assyria, where they uh, somehow are used the Assyrian uh, names, are used the Assyrian names of villages of persons, I use also Assyrian traditions. Imagine uh, the, there is an exercise where there is an interaction between the teacher and the student. Or how our, the, the Assyrian cultures were, there is another, another, another example, how a guy, uh, I, I mean, I invent the exercises, but I try to transmit, to reflect the, the way of thinking of the people who speak this language. How were the clauses of Assyrian people at that time? And I recreate a story as an exercise in order to introduce the reader or the learner in the Assyrian culture. This is, in my opinion, the best way to, how would I say, to go forward. Meanwhile, I'm learning a language. Just uh, making the conjugations or the, the, the declination or the inflection of, 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 a, of a name, it wouldn't help the reader or the learner to know about the Assyrian uh, specific uh, issues, whether language, uh, uh, history, or daily life uh, events that, that I, by myself, have been living. So this is, I try through the exercises transmit the same tradition, transmit the same legacy, but at the same time, I try to take the reader to, the, to Assyria and make him part of what they feel, how they acted, and so on. It's a modern language. We should not forget that. As a Assyrian language is like any other language that must reflect their typical uh, elements, aspects of the daily life, of their history, and so on. That's why, yeah, of course. Um, Michael, <coughs> you just raised your hand, so let me go ahead and, and pass the mic on to you so you can ask your question. Hi, Michael, welcome. Shalom alohan, and uh, thank you to the Assyrian Studies Association and Rabi Ephraim for a wonderful talk uh, and wonderful Q&A with Sargon. Uh, my question is simply, can you tell us about what it's been like to be uh, studying 
teaching and innovating the language at the highest academic level in this field with other scholars who may not be Assyrian. And just now you're emphasizing the living part of our language, and that involves some cultural awareness with scholars who may not have the cultural awareness. Can you talk about what has been the joys and also maybe the frustrations of dealing with scholars in your field who, who may not appreciate our cultural, uh, the cultural dimension of a living language? Uh, thank you, and it's good to hear your voice. Yes, uh, imagine I'm, I'm since 1980 in Western world, and each time when uh, they ask me where you are from, I always, I have to make a huge introduction to the people who do not know where Assyria is and who Assyrians are and where Tigris and Euphrates are and so on. This is the first introduction. Second, then when I, when I entered at an academic level, I realized that the scholars are uh, well um, trained as far as the ancient part is concerned. But mean, when we go through the recent or modern part, there is a huge lake. So uh, the, in question of, of uh, frustrating and uh, also uh, rejoicing the, the issues, yes, there is an experience of uh, being disappointed and at the same time uh, being happy because disappointed uh, a scholar who has been uh, studying for years uh, the liturgical texts or the biblical texts of Shotta or of Maraprem should know who Maraprem uh, was and is. No, he's Syriac, but uh, why do we have this big confusion? Because it's also, uh, you should keep in mind, I'm answering your question in a gradual way, uh, Michael. Uh, in the last 2000 years, the history, the Syrian legacy and so on has been focused mainly on ecclesiastical issues. There haven't been the chance to, to transmit the Assyrian legacy from the daily life issues onward. What we know about the Assyrians who are called Syriacs, Nestorians, Chaldeans, Jacobites, and so on, is only in the context of ecclesiastical history, uh, liturgy, biblical issues, and so on. This was my, my mm, and I'm, I'm facing day, uh, day per day this, this inconvenience because each time I have to explain to the modern society, whether in Spain or in, in England or in the United States or wherever I am in the Western world, I have to explain them that Assyrian people did not uh, vanish uh, as the prophet Nahum said, but they are still alive like any other nation, any other people. The only uh, pity issue is they their land has been stolen, I am very sorry to use these words, by others and it has been given to others and that's why today there is a, good, uh, a huge doubt up, uh, upon the Assyrian identity. Assyrians have the right as any other nation to develop their language, develop their uh, history, or learn their history, and also place as any other nation. This is the next step. Language is one of the main means. So this uh, disappointments, I have um, experienced many of them, even among the scholars, because uh, my discussions were always with them. Look, uh, okay, you talk about Syriac, but, but what does it mean? Just explain it from an uh, etymological point of view. Surit or Surait has the same root as Ashur. Why do you want to limit it only to the ecclesiastical issue? There is, there is a, 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 I, I use always this phrase, when uh, in, in the Easter time we say, a happy Easter in, in Assyrian. And they use always Okay, uh, happy Easter. The answer is to you and to all 
Assyrians, Surai, Christians. I mean, we all are Christians. Why do you specify a Surai? Because it's related to the Assyrian people. This is what the Western world didn't know because our, let's say, our legacy has been transmitted always on behalf of the church uh, uh, leaders or professors or scholars, and which was mainly focused on the church history, which mainly has tried to focus only on the phase issues. There is no national, no traditional, typical, uh, let's say, uh, the daily life issue in it. It's only focused on your face. That's why the Western world didn't have the chance to get in touch, a real touch, with the Assyrian richness as a people, as a nation, as a language. This is why today uh, there's a discussion, why do you call it Aramaic or you call it? No, Assyrians deserve like any other nation, like Spanish or uh, German or English and so on, to be called Assyrian. But we do, ha we do ha we have to go a long way in order to explain to the people that Assyrians are today alive, are alive people, alive uh, nation, and especially they have a, a life language. And I'm happy that there's interest to learn it, not only for Assyrians, but also for those who want to learn a new language, which is huge in content. Yeah. The, the problem is this, Nobody knows that when we talk about the, the cradle of civilization, we, we refer to the ancient period, that this ancient period is still alive between Tigris and Ephrathus, which is the land of the Assyrians. Mikhail, I don't know what I answered your question. Well, I just no, no, uh, Basima Rava Rabi, Joab uh, Rava Spaiwa, and thank you for all the information you shared. And I, I hope that uh, there's an opportunity with all the materials you're developing and the different levels of language education that uh, as we try, as we try to come together as a nation through di different initiatives, some that you're involved in like Assyrian self-governance, um, that we can start showing the world that we are a living people with a living language um, and, and deliver these, these tools for our people to grow. Thank you. I mean, the Assyrians have the same right as in any, any uh, other uh, nation to, to provide the world with their vision upon their history, upon their language, and upon their legacy, whether uh, literary or any other issues that are related to them. This is what we have to uh, explain to the people. Learning a language is probably the first path or the first step in order to get in touch with a uh, culture. This, uh, Sargon asked me, how many languages do, do you speak? It's not just a question of quantity, it's a question of quality. Each time I talk in German or in English or in, in, in Spanish or in Italian and so on, I feel as one of them. I get them as, I, I follow them as they, they sing, they reason and they feel. This is the main reason why I have been learning languages. And imagine when I talk in my own language. Uh, by the way, before ending, I would love to, to, to provide you with, with a gift, a virtual gift, as we are not there, as we are talking about the language. I have uh, dropped a, a poem in our language, in a Syrian language, which is called the, uh, the New Race of Assyria. Nuhama Khatat Ashur. Alexandra, when you wish, I would love to, to read it because so the people who probably have uh, never heard our language, the beauty of our language, they have the modern one, okay? Uh, they would uh, have the chance to, to have it. Of course, yes. Shall I start it now or afterwards? No, please go ahead. We would love to hear it. Wait, I'm going to the computer. Okay, I just want to thank okay. you for this question. Yeah, just a second. Ephraim, while you're okay. looking for that, I have to I have to tell you when you were when you're saying Kulha Surayim Shihaya, of course yeah. the other the other thing that popped into my head was in areas there are some areas where they use of course, Suraya as synonymous with Mshihaya. 
And then there are areas, like you said, where they use both. And if they use both, was that because they were also possibly aware that there were Assyrians who were not Christian? They were absolutely Assyrians, and they are still Assyrians. But as you said, the, t the, the term has um, acquired, that's, that's the, the direction of the semantic is this. Syriac has become synonymous for Assyrian at the same time Christian. Mm. Very interesting. But, but the people do uh, our, uh, the people do not uh, analyze the the, the 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 expression from a linguistic point of view, from an etymological point of view, and from a semantic point of view. If you analyze it, even the roots of of the, of the terms are exactly the same. But just we don't give time and space to explain uh, those issues because this is the richness of a language. But of course, um, Shihai has become synonymous of Surai because all those Surais, they were Assyrians or they are Assyrians. If you allow me, I will go uh, uh, with Nuhama Hata Atoraya. Assyrian new resurrection or rising. يَوْمَ دَقِيَمْتَ لِبْنَيْ أُمْتِي تَيْلِ زَوْنَ دَرْعَشْتَ بِعَمِّ الْدَرْخِمْ طَيْلِ لَقِيَمْتَ الْرِقْلِهِ كَشِّرَعِيدْ إِدَ دْرَيْلِ آتُرْ إِدْيُوْ لَبْنَيْ تَدْبَيْتِمْ شُرَيْلِ Do you hear me well? Hello? Perfect. Okay. عَمْ عَدْ يَوْمَانَ إِتُوْتِ الْنُخْرَاعِ لَقْلِيلِ Bardupie Utle Beneta de Beit Lamsele, a Penshuzawe, Saure, Odraned Nohrae Drele, a Trequisha Umte at Hashalakne, a Toraididium, the Pauda Atika Ashle, Pauda Diram, it means mistake. Wap Holta at the Marieste, Marieste at Madabra, no take dishle, Labnated Umte, Benoshil Puyadak Pishle. وأمل خزو خاتا والسزجارو تجرشلي الخاتي توت تقشت بدورا شم شريلي حقرو الدورة عتيق قد عشر مشنيلي لشرارة إيتوته هونان دبيته مقريلي ولبنيت أمته أمتان الشعيرة مهويلي لك ها وبخة شو شارد عطر مكليلي مطلب حبر عيشة وحويار العم هميتيلي آشور خاتا هيا يوتا بدمت سهد مرديلي بل خود بشقلت اطره و بنيتت امته مقنيلي يوم تحش و بخيا مرير المقاطر الحقلي پير خاتا و ايريبت امته تريسايت كملي و شمه شعريرة قليانا ايت و رشما ايت حتملي بتربيتا و يلبانا علايا هيا يوتا حملي لشانة و تشعيته يومانا بمدرشتا سملي المقريتة وقليتة جزة لبناته وبنونه قملة وبقشتة إيتوتة زدقتة للشانة السناية قصلة وعين بريرة بإيداعتة جمرتة شبلة بيولبانة سورايا إديوم برنية كميلة عمقلة النوحامة أخ أمة وبهر الدنحة أخ أمتة سقلة إيقارة شمر حيمة بلبة كل خاطو راية شتلة بآدي آتا ودميا الحب ما ندريش عاشر محمل لسيمت الأمت كابش عمن لشقلت أطر محايد شمن لك نشيا فرشان راحق منن لانطرت الشمن لشا تغدمن بينت عمد آتر بلخد إتسز جاروتا بقاي مبالح ويادا ملب وكل أو يوتا بمرحق مبيته زويا عد عمق بلبه كينوتا اد إيلا ما أنا شعريرات قيام خاتا وبيتايو اديو عم مبريشا مطل شما تودي تانايا قريا أخ ياقبايا ونسطرنايا وكلدايا أب وارتبقسايا وقاتوليقايا وبروتايا أخ سوريويا وسورايا إيلي آتورايا This is what I was telling مشيحا خا وعيتا أخ بخري إلى دا إيشا مشيحا خا وكارزوتا إلى دا أبن بطري كيانة إيتوتة إلى دا أبن بلية البالبريشة هيا يوتن إلى دا 
بدنيا علماء يئون برون الدهدا امتا اخ تودي تانا يئون هدام الدعيتا انا سورايا مشي حايا لا ادبي حنبوتا الا بيك شك حنفو يادا واتا واويو شمد امتي كتيوي لبملا على هايا نويوت على القيام تد عمي بقال اشعايا ابم دايم لشقلت قطره امتانايا آشور بقيمة أخذك آمر نوية ببوما آل هاية مدبارة آتور بقيمة وبيشة أمتا آود لم هيم بقيمة آتور أمتا بناكر ملتا شاررتا من آل هاية ولتا آتور بكملة مطل إلى م آل هرشم زرع خاطة آتور مطيل الدرخة كميلة ويرم زونة بيولبانة وعدانة النوحانة خميلة شبخت الدمه ويقرا الدوحه بايش ثقيله لبنيت بيته بدينوي آلها بهاو كفيله نينو بقيمه وبريمه اخ قمايا اطر مشريه بنيانو برونزا لهايا لبلم بودا خرايا دلشو قبنيانو النخرايا بيد بيرا وخاتا ذس ذا نيو جينيريشن جينيريشن بيد بيرا وخاتا مكبشه يالو البيت ولبنان من إلا مباسق شمن آتم قايم برايم عمن بذشت دنين بمخزق القوم محامغ الأمتن أخ نطرق اليمن بيولبانا وتربيتا بكامل كل خاط ورايا دل بنيت الأمته عيني له ينخرايا بشاق الأطرة بنوشة وعدران على هايا بالخد بآذي أرخا جاخر تبها وزكايا سورايا اديوم شوق ما ملت زونا من ويانا سنيقيون الهون وقميرا وهو باخو مع اليانا ادلك كنوشيا عمن عواد لبا لك هاو مربيانا ان قبل خلق دادي هداما بهاوي سكي ابنيانا نو حامد عمد اطر تيلي هاو تسندانا ويامد اطر ويامد عمد اطر كملي هاو تقدرانا شو زاود أمت الآتر بوطلة هاود نطرانا لبنيت أمت خاود كشيرة وهونانا. Thank you for your patience. Uh, for your patience. How do you start going? This is the language. Thank I you. hope you, you enjoyed it. You all. Thank you very much. That was wonderful. That was a wonderful way to conclude this webinar. That thank you so much for that uh, beautiful, beautiful poem. Um, and actual immersion in both language and culture, of course. Yes, indeed. So yes, we have reached the, the end of this webinar. I'd like to mention that this webinar was recorded and will be available for your viewing on our website, AssyrianStudiesAssociation.org, and also on our YouTube page, Assyrian Studies Association. I wanna first thank everyone who took the time out of their schedules to join us today for this book talk webinar. I want to also thank you for all your questions and interest you had about Dr. Yildiz's book and about the importance of the Assyrian language. For those who are interested in purchasing a copy of the book yourself, you can do so on our website. I also want to thank our presenter today, Dr. Ephraim Yildiz. Your conversation was not only fascinating, but compelling in a way that we want to learn more about future books you have in store for the Assyrian language. I want to also thank our moderator, Dr. Sargon Donabed, for his insightful contribution to this discussion. Lastly, I just want to mention um, that ASA will be doing more webinars like this during the summer and during the fall. And if you have not already done so, to register to receive emails by visiting our website, AssyrianStudiesAssociation.org, and to follow us on Instagram at Assyrian Studies and also on Facebook to learn more about our upcoming events, grant deadlines, webinars, future projects, and how you can be part of preserving the Assyrian cultural heritage. Well, on that note, it's a wrap. So thank you, everybody, and have a safe weekend. Thank you very much. Uh, it has been a huge pleasure for me, and I hope that it's not going to be the first and last time we are sharing such a wonderful while, because it's also the, the best way to get in touch with a culture to learn about this culture, its language and so on, and is the best way to learn each other. The language is the main mean, we should use it. So yeah. language is huge in that sense. I invite you to learn it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Ephraim. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>